Shabbat Shalom, Mishfakah, Shabbat Shalom, Hallelujah, Barak Yahuwah, we give y'all all the glory and we give y'all all the honor on this set apart day, this Shabbat, a day that the Most High has given us. All right, um, the end time empire, end time empire. Um, believe it or not, again, um, there is an end time empire. Um, and it's actually um, against the Most High Yah's kingdom. Hallelujah. And we're going to try to pull out today uh, what that empire is. And But we're going to build. I got a lot of slides. I don't know if I'm going to finish, uh, finish a lot of it today. We're going to see how this plays out. But again, uh, we're going to see what the end time um, empire is. Hallelujah. All right. Let's dig. Now, understand, to understand um, the end time empire, Mishra Ka, um, we have to go back to, to Genesis, all right? Because when you understand um, Bible, Bible has a lot of um, um, allegories. they got a lot of things that mean this and mean that. You got to be able to understand the language of the Bible. So um, we have to understand and go back to, to Genesis here. Um, we understand that, that Adam and Eve, they were the first man and the first woman that were uh, placed on the earth or placed in the garden. And we know the story that they uh, they sent before the Most High Yah. They broke the commandment. He told them not to do a particular thing. And they disobeyed him. They broke the commandment that was given to them. And so, therefore, sin began to come into the world. Then we understand that's when we understand 1 John 3 and 4. That sin is what? The transgression of the law. So that law that was given to them, even though it was not on physical tablets, but it was spoken straight from the mouth of Yah, it was a oral law that was given to them. And they broke that law. And because they broke that law, now we have sin. So therefore, because of their sin, hallelujah, everything went haywire. Um, Eden was a place of, of, of peace and it was a place of tranquility. Everybody uh, was getting along, animals and dogs and cats wasn't fighting and barking against each other. And the alligators weren't eating people and biting people and all these different things. It wasn't none of that going on. Everybody was at peace. And, um, and we understand that Adam had dominion over that place. But again, when he sinned, he lost that. He lost that because of his sin. Hallelujah. And because of his sin, the whole world went into chaos. Hallelujah. Everything went wow. The animals start going crazy. Nature start going crazy. Everything because of his sin. And because of this, the Bible says that there was judgment that was given upon them. Adam had to stand before Yah. Eve had to stand, stand before Yah. And he told them the, um, different things that was going to happen um, because of their sin. The main thing they understood, they were kicked out of the garden. And also they was going to experience um, not only a spiritual death, but a natural death was getting ready to take place concerning them. So they was given judgment. He judged them, but he also gave them. And as when he was talking to Eve, you know, we understand that she was going to have pain and childbearing and all these different things that, that was told to her by the Mosai. But one thing that was told to her was a prophecy. Uh, the prophecy was Genesis 3.15. This was a prophecy that was given to them. Um, if you could read that um, right here on the screen, um, Genesis 3 and 15, there we are, if you will. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Hallelujah. Praise Yah. So we understand that uh, there is a prophecy coming um, about a seed that would come from Eve. All right. And this, the seed shall bruise thy head and thou shall bruise his heel upon Satan's seed. So we're talking about the seed of, of, of her seed, Eve, a woman, and the seed of, of Satan. All right. So there's a battle that's going on. So we understand prophetically. We understand this is talking about no other than Yahusha Hamashiach. Hallelujah. So understand that there was an expectation um, by Adam and Eve because of this prophetic word. There was an expectation of a son that would come um, do their do their line. So obviously, um, you know, they had two sons. And they had, of course, they had more according to the Apocrypha. But um, in the K KJV, the sons are highlighted are Cain and Abel. 
And we know what happened, the story of Cain and Abel. We know that Cain slew his brother, Abel. So therefore, none of, them, none of those two were able to be the chosen seed. Hallelujah. So, um, of course, Abel was dead. And Cain, because of his sin, was cast out. It was a mark that was upon him. And he was cast away. But there was a son that, that came forth after that. And the son was the name Seth. Seth was the son. So he is the progenitor of the chosen seed. Okay. So now the chosen seed was going to come through Seth. Hallelujah. Y'all following me? Hallelujah. I'm going to build something today. We're going to try to build. All right. So we understand that the chosen seed from the time of, of Adam's sin and the time Seth was born, you're talking about 130. Okay. So we're talking about a uh, year 130. Seth was born and he lived 912 years. Okay. So now we're going to go down the line of the chosen seed. I'm going somewhere with this. All right. Because again, Cain and Abel now is out the picture. Seth is now the chosen seed, the chosen line that's being used to present, hallelujah, Yahusha Hamashiach. All right. So year 235, you see Enos was born. He lived 905 years. Year 325, Canaan was born and he lived 910 years. 395, Mahalahal was born and lived 895 years. Year 460, Jared was born and he lived 962 years. Hallelujah. And year 622, Kanak, also we know as Enoch, he was born and he lived what? He lived at that point 365, 365 years. And we know what happened to uh, Enoch. Hallelujah. So year 687, Methuselah. Methuselah was born and he lived 969 years. Who was the, uh, who was the man that lived the longest on the earth? Methuselah. Methuselah, Methuselah Nehemiah. <clears throat> Correct. He lived... 969 years. We're talking about the chosen seed now. Year 874, Lamech. Lamech, he was born and he lived 777 years. All right. Now, year 930, Adam. Adam dies. Adam lived 930 years. And we see now Enoch, 987. You understand that Enoch lived 300 something years before he was taken by Yahuwah. Year 1042, Seth, the chosen seed, he dies. Seth lived 912 years. Year 1056, Noah, or Noah, he lived 950 years. Year 1140, Enos, all right? Enos dies and he lived 900 in five years. We get to the year. You see how the years is moving. You see the length of time that these patriarchs are living. They're living a long life. Nehemiah brought this out when we talked about um, uh, the flood. We talked about these things and we talked about the law. Nehemiah brought out that how these people overlapped. They lived so long that they lived in different generations. So no doubt that they knew the law because they were overlapping generations. Hallelujah. So we see this. We're seeing this right now, how they, how they live so long, 900 years and 800 years. So if they understood the law and they were keeping the law, it overlapped in generations. All right. 12-9, Mahala, he died. He lived 895 years. They're overlapping. They were living in the same time frame. Hallelujah. Year 14-22, Jared dies. He lived 962 years. Year 15-56, Noah or Noah has three sons. This is important right here. Year 1556, he has three sons. Shem, Shem, Cam or Ham, Japheth, his three sons. Very important. We know that this is important because after what? After the flood, what happened? Three, these three sons did what? They populated, populated the earth. earth. Hallelujah. So this is the great job, priestly. They populated the earth. This is important right here. All right. 1556, Shem lived 600 years. 1651, 
Lamech. Lamech was who? He was the father of Noah or Noah. All right. He dies. All right. Lived 777 years. He died right before the great deluge, right before the great flood, 1656. See, his father dies. All right. All these people were overlapping each other. All right. They understood that they was keeping the law. You better believe that they were keeping the law because they all was overlapping each other. So they was living in their time. So no doubt that they was having conversations about the law. All right. But year 1656, the great flood. All right. 1656, Methuselah in the year 1656, Methuselah lived 969 years. All right. He dies. 1658, a fork side. We're starting moving in now. We're starting to get closer to the Hebraic understanding. All right. 1658, a fork side lived for 38 years. 1693, Salah lived 433 years. All right. 1723, Eber lived 464 years. Who is Eber? Anybody know who Eber is? The father of the Hebrew. The father of the Hebrews. Hallelujah. Excellent. Excellent, Zakane. Hallelujah. All right. So this is when you're getting into Hebrew now. Understand it. The lineage here starting to go into that. 1773, Eber. 1757, Son Peleg. 1787, Raul. 1819, Sirug. All right. All right. We're going somewhere. 1878, here comes Terah. Who is Terah? Who is he the father of? Abraham's father. Abraham's father. All right, all right. So 1878, now you hear 1948, Abraham, he lived 175 years. We understand that his wife was Sarah, 1958. 1996, Peleg dies, all right? Lived 239 years. 1997, Nahar dies. He lived 148 years. Now, 2000, all right, 2000. Noah dies and lived. At the time of the flood, Noah was 600 years old, according to scripture. Noah was 600 years at the time of the flood. And after the flood, he lived an additional 350 years after the flood. All right. Now, this is where you start to see the rise of the Hamites after the death of Noah, because in the first 2000 years, you see how the chosen line or the chosen seed started to be established from the time of the sin of Adam until the time of Seth. You have just about a little bit over 2,000 years. Now, I need to let you know something. Now, the, the, the world is set up in increments. It's set up in 2,000. So you see the first 2,000 years from the time of, of Adam, from his sin, up until uh, the death of Noah, that generation right here. That's 2,000 years. All right, that was the chosen seed generation. Now, after that 2,000 years, here is the rise of the Hamites. The Hamitic dynasty now was in full force. All right, we know Ham had four sons. His first son, his first son is Misarim. What do we know that as today? Egypt. Egypt. Great job, B. Akbi. Great job. All right, what is the second son? Is Canaan. Who was that known of? Where is that located? Who did the children of Israel conquer to get the land? Can the Canaanites? Yes. Excellent. These are two sons of Ham. All right. But who knows anything about Fut? Where is that located right now? Uh, that's in Africa. I believe, I believe that's like um, like Ethiopia. Great job, Nehemiah. A little Liberia in the northern Liberia. part of uh in the northern part. It's in Africa. Yeah, I knew I knew it was in the north. I just couldn't remember exactly where. Yeah, Liberia. Great job, Nehemiah. Great job. And the last son is who? Kush. What'd you say, Mama Stone? Kush. Great job. Kush, the Kushites. So he had four sons. 
All right. So Nimrod, and we talked about this in weeks past. Nimrod was the son of Cush, and he began the Hamitic reign as a world empire. We understand that Nimrod was what? He was the first world leader. A Hamite, a black man. He had everybody in that, in that time, everybody had to answer to who? Nimrod. And if you look at the apocryphal books, you even see that, that Terah, which was the father of Abraham, was in the kingdom of that. And young Abraham was telling his father, like, why are we here? Why are we sitting here worshiping this guy and, and, and the son? And, and, and why are we not stepping out and worshiping the Yah of heaven? You'll read that in, I think it's Jubilees. It talks about that, if I'm not mistaken. But Nimrod was running everything. He was running the world at that time. All right? Let's dig. All right. So we understand from the time of, of, um, of Nimrod running, then you had another Hamitic empire rising up. And he's no other than the man himself, King Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was a Hamite. He was a black man. So you went from a world power of Nimrod being a world power now to another world power, world power, Nebuchadnezzar. Now, understand the key word is world power. Now, he had a lot of empires, empires in Africa that rose up, you know, but they was kind of local empires. But Nimrod was a world power and king. Nebuchadnezzar was a world power, all right? So we're going to dig in um, um, of where or how this happened from King Nebuchadnezzar. Um, Second Chronicles 36, uh, starting at 15. Um, Lyria, if you don't mind for me, please. And let me see. I'll okay. just read. Uh, and the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up betimes and sending because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of Yahuwah and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of Yahuwah rose against his people. Uh, let me see just a moment. Sorry, my screen went away for a second. That's all right. Might take me a minute to get back. Uh, okay, that's the, it was just the last part where till there was no remedy. Okay, so what was going on right here? So, all right, the children of Israel, we understand that they're in to the chosen land right now. They got into the land. We understand Deuteronomy. They were told certain things. When you get into that land, don't y'all start acting crazy. Don't start losing your mind when you get into that land of Canaan. I'm going to allow y'all to go in here now, but don't act crazy. If you act crazy, I'm going to kick you behind out of here. I'm going to put you, I'm going to make this happen to you. That's going to happen to you. Sure enough, our ancestors acted a fool. They went into the land. They start acting crazy. First, um, the Israel, Israel or the Northern Kingdom, at that time, we know it was split up. It was split after David, um, Solomon took over. Solomon was in terrible sin, lost his mind, okay? Because of this, the kingdom was rent, all right? It was taken from him. So you had the Northern Kingdom and you had the Southern Kingdom. All right. So at that time, the Northern Kingdom was acting so crazy. I think it's under Jer Jeroboam. He was acting crazy. The Syrian army came, took the Northern Kingdom up out. All right. That left what? That left Judah. All right. That left Yahuda. It left us there. They wasn't really no better. They was acting crazy. The prophet Jeremiah was, ro was rose up in that time. He was a prophet to who? The house of Judah. He did have some prophecies to Israel. But his main purpose was to the house of Judah. So he was prophesying to them about coming out your idolatry. Go back to what Yah said. Go back and do this. And you had prophets that was there. That was saying, Jeremiah, crazy. Don't listen to him. He about to say all this. Don't listen to him. We fine. Everything is fine. That sounds so familiar to what's going on right now. Yah is sending prophets of the truth. You got you know, some Christian pastors there that don't want to preach and teach the truth, don't listen to them guys that say they're Hebrews, they crazy, this and that. Listen, stuff is repeating itself right now. You see the repeating of this stuff going on right now, right? So during this time, 
The Bible says that there were prophets that were sent to the house of Judah. But they said what? They mocked them. They mocked them. They mocked the prophets and despised their words and misused the prophets until the wrath of Yahuwah arose against the people. All right. So they kept going on. All right. And I'm going to take verse 17. Liri, I don't know if your screen is together, but I'm going to read verse 17. Therefore, he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees. Who was the king of the Chaldees? No other than who? King Nebuchadnezzar, who did what? Who slew their young men with the sword in the house of the sanctuary and had no compassion upon young men. He didn't care. He, he didn't care. He was doing, he was a servant. The most I actually called Nebuchadnezzar my servant. How can a hermetic heathen be the servant of the Most High? Because he put him in a position as a rod of connect of correction to his people. So if you're following my obedience, you at this point in time are my servant. Yes, Nebuchadnezzar was the servant of the Most High in this context. Yes, he was. So listen, he didn't care about young men or maiden or old men or him that stooped over the old people. He didn't care. He gave them all into his hand. It didn't matter. See, this is why, this is why even now, so when you talk about what we've been taught in church, there is a, and what we're taught in church was there's a God of the Old Testament and there's a God of the New Testament. The God of the Old Testament was a mean old guy, but the God of the New Testament and do his son, Jesus, everything is good. Everything's nice. Everything's pure. That does not line up with the scriptures. If you are in disobedient to the Most High Yah, listen, the same thing, same Yah he was in what they call the Old Testament is the same Yah he is in the New Testament. Malachi 3 and 6 says he's what? I am Yah. And I do what? I change it not. All right. Let's dig, Mr. Cop. All right. We're establishing some background here. All right. All right. Uh, verse 18, Second Chronicles. Liria, are you, are you still there or are you still having problems? Um, I'm back. All right, go ahead. If you don't mind, please read verse 18. And all the vessels of the house of Yahuwah, great and small, and the treasures of the house of Elohim, and the treasures of the king and of his princes, all these he brought to Babylon. All right, stop right there. Now look what's happening. Because they wanted to act a fool. Our ancestors wanted to act a fool, right? And you want to be do what you want to do. You want to be disobedient. You want to be big. Little got you. This is what happened. Now the, our, our young men got slain. Our old people, our Zykanes and Emus were killed and all this. And listen, Nebuchadnezzar came in and wrecked shop. What did he do? He took the vessels of the Most High. We had, the temple had vessels. Vessels that was made of gold and, and silver and jewelry. They took, they robbed, they destroyed the temple, first of all, and took the vessels out, the great and small, and the treasures of, of the Most High, and the treasures of the king, and of his princes, and all these were brought where? To Babylon, where who reigned there? The Hamite, King Nebuchadnezzar, a Hamite, a black man that is reigning, that took pretty much the baton from Nimrod, all right? Verse 19, Lyria. And they burned the house of Elohim and break down the walls of Jerusalem and burned all the palaces thereof with fire and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. Mm, keep on reading. And then that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. All right, stop right there. Now look what happened here. Verse 20. He said, them that escaped, he meant to kill. Nebuchadnezzar, army, meant to kill. But by chance, you didn't get that sword. By chance, we didn't get you. That's all right. We're going to take you into captivity. We're going to take you to Babylon, where the service them his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. All right, Larry, y'all keep reading. To fulfill the word of Yahuwah by the mouth of Jeremiah. Uh-oh. Go ahead. Go ahead. Until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths, for as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and <laughs> ten years. 
Wow. So they thought Jeremiah was crazy. He don't look too crazy now. The Bible said that Yahuwah fulfilled the word of the prophet. He didn't let Jeremiah's words go down. He didn't let Jeremiah's prophecies fall, but he fulfilled. He made sure he fulfilled the words of his prophet. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Most High Yah. All right. Nebuchadnezzar, we're going to go move into Daniel chapter 2. This is where we're to highlight now. We're going into the meat of our lesson today. This is Daniel chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. Larry, I want you to read. I might stop you in the midst of trying to explain, but go ahead and read right now. And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. Mm -hmm. Then the king commanded to all the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, the thing is gone from me. Mm. If, you, if you will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, ye shall be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made a dunghill. But if ye show the dream and the interpretation thereof, ye shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. Mm. So here he is. Our people now are in Babylon. They're, they're here now. And they got a little settled in. Jeremiah's prophecy has came fulfilled. They're now under the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar. But here, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, all right, in chapter 2. He has his dream. But he had a dream. He could not remember the dream that he had. You know, we have that. We have dreams at night. Then we wake up like, man, I was dreaming about something. But I, I can't remember what the dream is about. This is what happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. So what he did was he went to the spiritual people, his soothsayers and the magicians and astrologers and, and all the sorcerers that was in his kingdom. Now, he had a kingdom with these people there. They had a purpose. They had a job being in the kingdom to interpret dreams and to cast spells, whatever he used them for from the realm of spirituality. He had them people set up there for that. And so he went to them looking for an answer. And so he was so adamant about wanting to know the dream, you know, and wanting to know you know, what the interpretation of it. First of all, he wanted to know what the dream was because he forgot it. Also, he wanted to know the interpretation of it. Uh, but he said, if you can't show me this dream, what's going to happen? We're going to have some new bathrooms in Babylon. I'm going to get ready to turn your house into a, a bathroom. <laughs> I'm, about to, I'm about to turn into a dung hill. That's what it means. And I'm a, you shall be cut into pieces and your house will be made of new bathrooms in Babylon. He wasn't playing. He had a dream and he, it was troubling him. And he wanted to remember what that dream was about. I need, I need y'all, since y'all spiritual, since y'all magicians, pull it out the hat, show me what it is. I need to know what it is. If you don't do it, I want to know so bad. I'm going to kill you. And I'm going to cut you to pieces. And I'm going to take your houses. And I'm going to turn them into bathrooms. We're going to be using bathrooms in your houses. We're going to break them down. All right. So this is what was going on. The king was adamant about knowing what he dreamed. Somebody help me break it to my memories. All right, Lyria, go ahead and read. They answered again and said, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will show the interpretation of it. The king answered and said, I know of a certainty that you would gain the time because ye see the thing is gone from me. Uh -huh. But if ye will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you. For ye have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me mm -hmm. till the time be changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that ye can show me the interpretation thereof. Mm -hmm. The Chaldeans answered before the king and said, 
There is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore, there is no king, lord, nor ruler that asks such a thing, such things at any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. Now look, look, now look what they told this man. They told the king this now. They told the king there is no man upon the earth that can do this. They, this this thing you, you asking of us, man, can't nobody do this. But Nebuchadnezzar looking at them, you, you supposed to be spiritual. Y'all supposed to be magicians. Why can you not tell me what my dream is? Now they start deflecting, well, can't nobody on earth do this? Can't nobody do? You asking something that's out of the bounce of, of, of Susan, out of the bounce of witchcraft. You, you asking something that we can't do. All right. Come on, Lyriot. Daniel 2, 11 to 16. And it is a rare thing that the king requireth, and there is none other that can show it before the king except the gods, whose dwelling is not with flesh. Wait a minute, Lyria. They said, wait a minute, what you asking us, can't nobody do this except the gods, whose dwelling is not in the flesh. I, well, if they're uh, soothsayers and magicians and all these different things, aren't they related to those gods? Aren't you, their, aren't you the boys of the gods? Aren't you their servants of the gods? So if, they, if, the, if those gods know it, why they ain't telling you? Come on, Lyria, read on. <laughs> For this cause, the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain. And they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. Mm -hmm. Then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree so hasty from the king? Then Arioch made the thing known to Daniel. Then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. Look, so Arioch, he getting ready to carry out what King Nebuchadnezzar said. Uh, we getting ready to start killing people at this point now. Um, you obviously... You, your gods ain't speaking to y'all. Y'all ain't what y'all said y'all was. I got y'all employed in my kingdom. I got y'all set up. And here I am. I'm asking you for something. And you can't even get it to me. So Ariok, which was the king's captain, he said, okay, it's time to get it cracking. It's about to be night night for y'all. All right? Because the king said, y'all are useless. Y'all are meaningless to me right now. Now, obviously, Daniel, he's in captivity. Daniel's in captivity. He doesn't know. He's not knowing what's going on. So he asked the captain. He asked him, like, what's going on, man? You know what I mean? Captain, like, listen, I got to slay cats right now because the astrologers or the spiritual people ain't doing their job. Daniel said, hold up. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me see what's going on. Let me hear what, you know, the king needs. And let me see if I can get the interpretation of this. All right? So here, Daniel, Daniel didn't know what's going on, but Daniel said, Look, let me, let me see what's going on. Let me pray to my Yah and see if we can get an answer. All right. Daniel chapter 2, verse 27. We skip down. Go ahead, Liria. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. Mm -hmm. but there is an Elohim in heaven Hallelujah. that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Hallelujah. Yeah. Thy dream. And the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. Hallelujah. As, as for thee, okay. Let me interrupt you here, Liria. Let me interrupt you. That that pointed out to me. He said, There is a Yah in heaven, said the Dewberry, a Kothi Dewberry, that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar. Real quick, if someone can give me Amos 3 and 7. Amos 3 and 7, please. Hallelujah. And I need someone to get me Leviticus chapter 25, verse 55. Amos 3 and 7. Surely, Yahuwah Elohim will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Hallelujah. So what is Daniel telling to him? He's telling, listen, 
being that I am a servant, I'm a prophet of Yah. He reveals secrets to me, things that your magicians and your soothsayers and your astrologers don't know. He reveals his secret things and to his servant, the prophets. Hallelujah. Somebody give me Leviticus 25 and 55. Hallelujah. We're going to see who the servants are. Who are the servants? Leviticus 25, 55. Leviticus 25 and 55. Uh -huh. For unto me, the children of Yisrael are servants. Mm, who? They are Wait my a minute. servants. Wait a minute. Who? The children of Yisrael are servants. Uh -huh. They are my servants. Uh huh. Whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt. All right. Stop there, B. So we understand the servants of the Most High Yah are who? Israel. So he said, I do nothing unless I reveal my secrets to who? My, my servants, servants, the prophets. So if the prophets are who? Israelites. Hallelujah. Those mm -hmm. are the servants. Those are the prophets. Those are the ones that Yah is pouring his spirit on in this latter day. My servants, the prophets. This is why in Romans 3 and 1, Paul says the oracles of the Messiah is given to us. To the Israelites, hallelujah. Why to proclaim the truth? A true prophet is a Israelite, is an Israelite carrying a Israelite message, which is the law, statutes, and commandments according to Deuteronomy 13. All right, just want to throw that in there. In there, prophets are Israelites, those are the prophets, those are the servants that the, the secrets in this end time are being revealed to us for a reason. Why we are the servants, we are the prophets of the Most High. Go ahead, uh, Lyria. But there is a Yah in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the King Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. Mm. As for thee, O King, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. What should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. Mm. But, but as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king, and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. All right. Daniel, Daniel, the prophet of the Most High Yah is getting the information from Yah about what's going on with King Nebuchadnezzar. Go ahead, uh, Lyria. This image's head was of fine gold. Uh-oh, His... fine gold. All right, Mishraka. All right, we start breaking it down, this dream. All right, go ahead, Lyria. His breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, mm -hmm. his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Mm. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain mm. and filled the whole earth. Mm. This is the dream. And we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Mm. So Daniel, Daniel is prophesying, hallelujah, and telling the king what he dreamt. Nebuchadnezzar is bugging. He's tripping out right now, right? Because Daniel was able to tell him the dream that he forgot all about, the dream that he didn't remember. Daniel was telling him that, telling him the dream. So Daniel was telling him the dream that he said, listen, Nebuchadnezzar, you saw an image, and the image head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, silver, and his belly and his thighs of brass, 
his legs of iron, his feet part iron and clay. All right. So here's the illustration here of what he possibly seen. This is what he's seen. The head of gold, silver, chest and arms, two arms now. Look at the two arms are both silver, two. All right. Brass here. All right. Then you look at his legs, iron, and the feet, iron and clay. What does that really mean, though? Okay, it's one thing to, to see that. Daniel's about to give him an interpretation of what that dream is about. Because right now, Nebuchadnezzar's happy. He's like, okay, that's what I dreamed. But what does this mean? What does this really mean? All right, let's break this down. All right, so the head of gold, gold has the most value but the least weight of metal. That head, which, which Daniel was telling him, was Nebuchadnezzar. It was him. He, 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 the gold, his kingdom was flush. It was plush, all right? But the gold has the most value, but the weight of the metal gold was very light, but it represented Babylon, all right? That's what that represented. Daniel was telling him, he's talking about the empire, all right? Now, the chest and arms, two arms, all right, of silver. Silver is less in value than in gold, but it's heavier in metal than gold, all right? So you see the two arms of silver? Two arms represent two nations, all right? Two people coming together as one. This is no other than the Medes and the Persians, all right? All right, so the stomach and the thighs. Brass, what is that brass? Brass is less value than gold and silver, but it's heavy in metal than gold and silver, all right? And that brass is no other than the Greeks, all right? All right, so let's get to the legs. The legs, the legs are iron and feet, iron and clay. Iron, no doubt, is less value than all the other metals, but it's the heaviest and the strongest metal of all that was mentioned. This is no other than Rome, y'all, all right? Now, each empire declined in value as Daniel was telling the prophecy. You notice each empire declined in value, but increased in fierceness, ruggedness, and the ruthlessness as it went on. This is why the metals got heavier, because the kingdoms after um, King Nebuchadnezzar got strong and fierce as they went on, all right? And so gold is definitely softer than iron, as you see there. What is this saying about Rome? It's saying that Rome was ruthless. They're the iron. They're the strong metal. They're fierce. Hallelujah. Daniel goes on to say that a stone was cut out without hands and it struck the statue at the feet. Notice where it hit the statue. It hit the statue where there was the iron and the clay at the feet. Notice that y'all, get that, all right? And the image fell. Notice while the image fell, the other parts that was connected to the statue, the gold, the silver, the brass, was still attached when it fell. It still it was all together when it fell. And all of it, all of it, even though the stone struck the feet, all of it fell and it was broken to pieces. Now, what is that saying? What is Daniel's prophecy saying to King Nebuchadnezzar? What he's telling him that this last empire, the feet or in the toes here has remnants of the other kingdoms into it. It still had the gold in it. It had Babylon in it. It still had silver in it. And, and that represents the Medes and the Persians. It still had the brass in it, which is the Greeks. So elements, if you look at Rome right now, and if we look at Rome and we understand Rome right now, we understand that Rome has ancient things connected to it. You look at the Pope, the Pope has a fish hat. We talked about this weeks ago. Where did you get that from? You got that from the Philistines. The, uh, the Pope carried a cross in his hand. 
Where does that come from? All these other different empires, it's a mixture of all these different empires of the earth. It's a conglomerate of everything inside of it, all right? So they add elements of all the other empires of the earth connected into Rome, all right? So that's why when it fell, everything that was carrying over into Rome fell because Rome picked up a whole lot of stuff from all the empires in front of them, all right? So listen, after Daniel told him this, what did Daniel do? I mean, what did Nebuchadnezzar do? The Bible says that he fell down. He was so happy. He fell to his knees and he tried to worship Daniel. He tried to worship Daniel. Matter of fact, he, he wanted to pour out sacrifices and everything to Daniel because he was so excited that Daniel was able to give him the interpretation, not only the interpretation of the dream, but the actual dream. All right. So listen, Nebuchadnezzar was moved. His heart was OK. So he understood that. All right. My kingdom is not going to last. OK, I'm cool. I'm cool with that. But did that last? Did that last for King Nebuchadnezzar? No, because what he did after the fact, he created an image of gold. After all that Daniel told him and told him, like, listen, man, your kingdom was good. You, you had a great kingdom, but it, you're going to have a, a kingdom rising up that was inferior to yours. He thought about that thing, y'all. He thought about that. After well, I said, you know what? I ain't going out like that. I refuse to go out like that. What I'm going to do is set me up an image that looked exactly like me. It's me, an image of gold, because I'm not going out like that. I'm reigning. I'm King Nebuchadnezzar. I rule the world. I'm the world emperor. I'm the world empire right now. And I'm not going out like that. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to get everybody. Everybody in the kingdom, they're going to come to my feet. Lyria, we in chapter Daniel 3 now. We're going somewhere, y'all. We're going at, uh, we're in Daniel 3. Lyria, I'll start at, at the first verse. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Uh-huh. When Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Now, now okay, let me stop there. Now, look what he's doing. Daniel just told you, you had a dream. Daniel told you, you had a good reign, you had a good time, but there's going to be other empires taking over. He was cool at first, but right now he didn't got he didn't got hard headed. Like, oh no, I'm not going out like that. Just like when 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 Moses he went to Pharaoh and said, let the people go. First, he was like, Yeah, go ahead, let the people go. Then he thought about it. The Bible said his heart got hardened. Okay. So here's Nebuchadnezzar. Anytime that you in a king like that, and you and you're a world empire leader, you think you want somebody just going, like, oh, okay, I'm cool with my kingdom. No, that's power. Nebuchadnezzar had power of the world at that point. Just as Nimrod was ruling the world, he was ruling the world. All the nations were bowing down to Nebuchadnezzar. Look what he got. All the high officials, all the governors, the captains, everybody that had a title, had power, that you think that I've given you power, you're going to come bow under my power right now because I'm king live forever. I'm king live forever. Okay, go ahead, Lirio. Then the princes, the governors, and captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Mm. Now look at this. Look at this, y'all. Now look at this. So King Nebuchadnezzar, he said, listen, I got the word that my kingdom is going to go down, but I'm not going down like that. I'm the king live forever. And I'm going to make an image that look like me. That is me in gold. Y'all going to bow. Every time that music get cracking, y'all going to bow down to it. Let, to let y'all know I am king. But look at this. Nimrod, his Hamitic brother, did the same thing before him. He didn't create an image, but the image of Nimrod was worshipped. The whole world worshipped Nimrod. Bow down. Bow down to me. Worship me. Now, 
let me take it a little further. I might be peeking earlier, but look what happened. When Alexander the Great took over, what happened? His four soldiers, one of them was Ptolemy. He took over in Egypt. What did he do? He created an image that looked like him and had those dark races in Egypt bow down to the image that looked like him and his people. Look at the trend here. Let me fast forward. In the book of Revelations, the Roman church, the Roman kept there was an image that the whole world worshiped that was put up and the world worshiped this image. What is that image, y'all, that Rome has set up, that the world worships? You see the trend? You see what's going on here? Every time these, these world powers get in a position of power, they either are worshiped or they create something that looks like them for the people to worship. This is what Rome has done. Rome has set up a system and set up an image according to revelations that the world is bound down to worship. Where do they get it from? They got it from the empires before them that worship. Look what's going on. Listen, the world is innocent. It, it repeats itself. Ecclesiastes 1 and 9 said there's nothing new under the sun. Rome is mimicking a lot of these other empires that went before them. Y'all going to get this in a minute, all right? All right, so now the end of the Hamitic world, all right? I'm going to read this lyric, y'all. Verse 6, and now I have given all these lands. This is Jeremiah 27 here, all right? He said, I now I've given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. Here in the Most High, again, he called Nebuchadnezzar his what? He's my servant. He's my servant. And the beasts of the field have I given also to serve him. It's coming to an end, Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 7, and all the nations shall serve him and his son, his son's son. So what's that saying? That his dynasty is going to last to his grandson. So Nebuchadnezzar, his son, then his son's son, which will be his grandson, that will be the end of the Hamitic reign. You'll see that here in Jeremiah 27, 27. All the nations shall serve him and his sons and his son's sons, his, him and his grandson, until the very time of his land come, and then many nations and great kings shall serve themselves. After the Most High used uh, these, these different nations that's around Israel, what did he do with them? He used them and he do what to them? He throw them away. After he used them, y'all served a purpose, I'm done with you. What's going to happen to this end time empire of Rome? Because they have a reign. They're being used right now, whether you believe it or not. Y'all is allowing this to happen. Their reign and what they're doing it's prophecy. It's connected to the word. So it has to happen. But after he gets done with Rome and his empire, what's going to happen to them? All right, let's dig. There's prophecy on that. Ezekiel 38 and 39 talks about that. Hallelujah. All right. All right, let's move to Daniel chapter 5. All right. Bill Shazar. This is the grandson. This is the grandson. Of, of, of King Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, all right? Daniel chapter five, I'm gonna read literally y'all for the sake of time. The king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Nebuchadnezzar's going off the scene. Before he went off the scene, he got humbled. He was like a beast in the field. His heart was converted, but here is the grandson of him, all right? This is prophecy. His grandson now is in position, all right? So he had a feast, all right, and drank wine before thousands, all right? Here's the mistake, verse 2. Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels, uh-oh, which his father, now this was not his father, but a lot of times, 
you know, when you're related to the king, they use, you know, if you're the son or grandson, they'll call him son or father. But it's, this is actually his grandson, all right? His father, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem. And the king and the princess, his wives, and his concubines might drink therein. They're having a party, y'all. They're having a party getting down, <laughs> and they're having a good time. Verse 3, then they brought the golden vessels, uh-oh, that were taken out of the temple of the house of Yah. That's where you messed up at which was at Jerusalem, and the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines drinking them. They had a party, but took the vessels of the Most High Yah, took them vessels and started drinking at them and, and using it in their parties that they were using. Now, this party was to their heathen gods. They were celebrating their heathen gods, but was using the holy things of Yah in the midst of having a pagan party or their heathenistic party. This is where they messed up. Verse four, they drink wine and praise the gods of gold. Wow. And silver of brass and of iron and of stone and of stone. They having a good time. All right. Verse five, in that very same hour, Taha, came four fingers of a man's hand. Good, Yah Almighty. And wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Verse 6. Then the king's countenance was changed. He got scared. Like, what is that? And his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his loins were loosed. And his knees spoke one against another. The man peed on himself. The man was so scared. He looked and saw that he, started, he peed on himself. That's what it means. His joints of, of loins were loosed. He used a bathroom on himself. At verse 7, the king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers. Here we go again. He didn't learn that from his grandfather. But here you go. Oh, I see this. Let me bring the astrologers in and the soothsayers. All right? And this is a day on chapter 5. This was a say on the wall. I'm, I'm moving down for the sake of time. And this is the writing that was written. Mine, mine, to kill you, Seren. This is the interpretation of the thing. Many, Yah have numbered thy kingdom and finished it. This is the end of the Hamitic dynasty. Tekel, thou art weight in the balances and are found wanting. Peris, thy kingdom is divided and given to who? This is the empire. This is prophecy. This is what Daniel prophesied. It was given to the Medes and the Persians. Then commanded Belshazzar. And they clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold about his neck and made a proclamation. Daniel came in, was brought in. He was able to prophesy and tell him what was on that wall. Hallelujah. And he made a, a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. And that night, Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldees, was slain. Now you see, Ms. Rakaar. Now. You see the end of the Hymenic dynasty from the time of Set. All right, we talked about this. From the time of Set up until the death of Noah, was about a little bit over 2,000 years, the establishment of the chosen seed. From the death of Noah up until this time of the Medes and the Persians, the time that Nimrod reigned, the time that Nebuchadnezzar and him, him his son, and his grandson reigned. This is now a little bit over 2,000 years. So now you got about 4,000 years now that's going by, all right? Now I told you uh, the world is set up in increments, all right? So you know the Bible talks about the seventh day, the seventh day of rest. So you see 2,000 went by at the end of Noah. You see now at the end of the Hamitic reign, all right? Now we're going to another reign of the Medes and the Persians, all right? Now the Medes and the Persians, these were two empires. That were coming together, all right. Two empire. The Medes was ruthless people. They was they was the war. They was like they was ruthless. They didn't play no games. But the Persians that were connected with the Medes, the Persians had the Benjamins. They had the money, all right. So the the Medes was the power of that kingdom. They were the power. But the Persians that was with them was the money pockets that was connected to them, all right. So they overcame 
the dynasty of, of Nimrod uh, and King Nebuchadnezzar. All right. All right. Now let's go to Daniel 7. All right. I'm doing good on time. It's 1151. All right. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and vision. Now I want you to understand something. A lot of times uh, scriptures are not in chronological order. It's not in order. Because you see here in the first year of Belshazzar, we know who Belshazzar was the grandson we were just talking about. But obviously in that first year that Belshazzar came into position of king, Daniel already knew what was going to happen. Daniel, this was already given to Daniel. What was getting ready to happen to Belshazzar? He already, so by the time he came in and they brought him in to interpret what was written on the roll, Daniel already knew it. That's why he was able to prophesy. He already seen it in the first year of this man being in his kingdom. All right? So Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his, on his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told us some of the matters. Verse 2. Daniel speaker said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. See, the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea. All right. Now, understand um, in sea, the sea in biblical prophecy, sea means nations, bodies of people. All right. In biblical prophecy, that's what that word sea means. All right. So there was striving going on, which means battles and nations of people were fighting and colliding with each other. This is what Daniel saw. All right. Verse three and four beasts in biblical prophecy. A lot of times that word beast means kings or kingdoms. All right. So four beasts, great beasts came up out of the sea, out of the nations and the bodies of people, diverse from one another. All right. Verse four. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings, all right? I beheld to the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it, all right? Who is this? From understanding the prophecy that took place in Daniel 2, who is this that Daniel's seeing right here? Who is he seeing? Anybody? Who is this lion? Nebuchadnezzar. Who said that? Laquanta. Laquanta. Exactly. That first lion that had eagle's wings. What do the eagle's wings represent? It represents Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom that was flying all over the place. He was conquering everybody. He was conquering everybody. His, his kingdom spread. It spread over everywhere. He was the one world leader at that time. That's what the eagle's wings represent. All right. I beheld to the wings there were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth. All right. His wings got plucked. Why he got plucked? He was no longer reigning over everybody no more. So that was wings that he had on him got plucked. And may stand upon the feet as a man and a man's heart was given to him. What is a man's heart? The Bible talks about the heart of a man. That is what? It's deceitful. That's what it says in scripture. So he was given a man's heart, deceitful heart at that point, because now the kingdom is going away. At one point, Nebuchadnezzar was hearing. After Daniel gave him a prophecy, he acted like he was turning. But guess what? He did just like every other man does. They want to be worshipped. Their heart is deceitful. All right? Verse 5. And behold, another beast, a second like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side. So here's this bear, all right? And on one side is raised up, and it had three ribs in his mouth of between the teeth of it. And he said thus unto it, Arise, thou devour much flesh. Who is this bear? Who is this kingdom, this beast? Who is this? Miss forgot anybody? Medes, Persians, Persians, the Medes and Persians. Why was one side of it raised up? Why did one side of that raised up? All right, 
So again, it goes back. The Medes and the Persians were two empires coming together as one. The Medes were the power, the strength, but the money side pocket of the money was the Persians. That's why it's imbalanced. That's why it's up like that. Because the Medes were the power, but the Persians were the money. All right? So that's why it was raised up. Even though it was one kingdom, that's why it was raised up. Because one was a little bit higher than the other. All right? And so the three ribs that was in the mouth of this beast. We understand it's Medes and Persians. What's the three ribs that was in the mouth? What does that mean? Who want to take a crack at it? Is that from them uh, conquering the first kingdom? There, you you ordinate there's three ribs the three, in the mouth. The three score? Is that the three score? Three. Was that the amount the amount of uh the, the amount of years that they would be in power? That's that's good. I didn't look at that, Nehemiah. That's good. The three what, kingdoms. What? Three, three kingdoms. Kingdoms. Who said that? Crazy. What kingdoms are they? That's a great answer. Great answer. All right, the three kingdoms. Three kingdoms. One kingdom, as Nate said, was what? Babylon. The Bible says they just, we just showed that they beat Babylon. So that's one kingdom. Who was another kingdom that was that was buying during that time? They wasn't a world empire at that time, but they were mighty. They was known as a power. Who in that time? Who was it? Mid the Medes. No, mm -hmm. not not the Medes. Who was the other mm -hmm. powers? You have Babylon. Who was another great? People are mm -hmm. black. Let me say they were black. Egypt. There you go. There you go. That's the second one. All right. I need the third one. Who was another powerful people? They weren't black, but they was they were they was going to soon come and take over. Greece. Yes. Hallelujah. Go ahead, LaQuarta. All right. So those are the three ribs that was in the mouth of the Mies of this bear. All right. In between the teeth of it. All right. And it devoured their flesh. So Mies, they was in power. Mies in, per in the Persians. They was in power at that time. All right. Because the Hamitic dynasty had ended. 2,000 years at the end of Noah, chosen seed coming in. 2,000 years, Nimrod. King Nebuchadnezzar, here's the end of the, of the Hamanic reign, all right? So now you're looking at now, do you have another people rising up now out of the sons of Noah, all right? All right, Daniel chapter 7, we're still there, verse 6. After this, I beheld and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four Heads and dominion was given to it. Who is this in prophecy? Who is this empire, Miss McCall? It's said it right here. Uh, the Ro Roman Empire, no, not the Roman. Who is this? Who is that? We are you already prophesied about uh, the lion. We already seen the lion, we seen the bear with the means of persons. Now we see the leopards. Who is the leopard? Greeks. Yes, Nehemiah, a leopard, all right, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. And the beast, this kingdom beast, had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. Who is the four heads represent, Nehemiah? Four generals. I, I didn't hear it. Go ahead, Sakin. I would say the four generals. The four generals are Cain Stone. Exactly. We, we getting biblical prophecy, y'all. We getting it. All right? Now, understand this. Look, your boy, Alexander Great, was a bad man. At the age of 19, he was a military genius. History tells us before the age of 32, he died. But that boy was bad at the age of 19. He had grown men. Following him, he was a conqueror. That's who he was. But he died before he was the age of 32. So he had, they didn't give it to his sons, but they gave it to his four generals. I believe his general was Cassandra, uh, Cassandra, uh, 
uh, Seleucus, uh, Ptolemy, um, and I'm missing another. Ptolemy, Cassander, uh, Seleucus, and what's the fourth one's name? Is it uh, Ant Antiochus? Yes, excellent. Those were the four generals that took over for Alexander the Great. And they, a dominion was given to them. Excellent, Ms. Picard. Excellent. Verse 7. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, a fourth kingdom, dreadful and terrible and strong. And see, look at the words, the descriptive words is being used about this kingdom. And it had a great iron teeth and devour and break into pieces and snap the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts. Look, this one was diverse from all the beasts that was before it. And it had 10 horns. Who is this that's being spoke of? That's Rome. 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 That's Rome. You hear what I said about Rome, y'all? It was dreadful. Terrible, strong, and silly. And it had the key right there. It had what teeth? What kind of teeth is it? Iron teeth. Iron. So we understand in the prophecy that the legs and the feet were iron. You see how you see how the Bible interprets itself? In the prophecy that Daniel prophesied in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the feet and the um and the toes were iron. So again, this is wrong. All right, and it break into pieces. It was strong. All right, let's go down to verse 17. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which shall rise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom, hallelujah, and possess the kingdom forever, even forever. Look what it's saying. That even though these four kingdoms shall rise, these empires shall rise, but when that stone that came out of that mountain that was cut out with no hands and it hit the feet, he said, the saints, who are the saints? The Israelites. It shall take the kingdom, all right, and possess the kingdom forever. So if the biblical prophecy tells us that the stone shall come out of a mountain and strike the feet, that means that Rome is still in operation because that prophecy is the kingdom of Yah or Mashiach that's going to strike the Roman kingdom. Now, that has not happened yet. So that means that Rome is still in charge now and that when Yahushua comes with his kingdom, he's going to take over the kingdom of the Romans because they are in operation right now. They're the ones in power right now. They are the ones, but in Luke 21 and 24, when Yahushua gave a prophecy that Jerusalem is going to be run down by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. These are Europeans. These are Europeans that took over. So you understand this. 2,000 years at the end of Noah, another 2,000 years from Nimrod and Nebuchadnezzar. Now you're going to the Europeans take over. They are in control right now until the end, until Yahushua come. Two, Four, six. When Yahusha comes back, we're going to be in the kingdom with Yahusha, which will be how many years? A thousand years. Seven years, seven completion. Two with the chosen seed of time from Seth until Noah. Two thousand more years with Nimrod, Nebuchadnezzar. Once Medes and Persians took over, two thousand years begins until now. We're on the end, Mishpachah. Of the 2,000 years. We're on the end. Because that year of millennial reign. Will completion of seven years. We're at the end y'all. Rome is, is the kingdom. And the empire that's in charge right now. I have a question. If biblical prophecy. Is telling us. That Rome is in charge right now. Why is our brothers and sisters. In Christianity. Wearing vestments. Like the Pope. Why are they keeping Sunday worship? Why are they keeping Christmas? Why are they keeping Easter? These things are being pushed by the Roman Empire, the end time empire. They are the ones that are talked about. They are the great harlot. 
Brandon, give me Revelation 17 and 4, please, real quick. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Bible tells us who's in power. We ain't got to guess. They're telling us. But Christianity, here we are walking in the ways of Rome. And I'm going to tell you how it happened. Give, give me Revelation 17 and 4. Seven, Revelation 17 and 4. Yes. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color. Uh oh, wait and a minute. Scarlet and purple? Scarlet and purple. Who wears scarlet and purple? Rome, the Catholics. Keep reading, please. <laughs> and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations. Full of what? Having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Uh huh. And upon her forehead was a name written Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, uh -oh. and abomination of the earth. Uh oh. What on his head it said what? Mystery, Babylon the Great. The mother of harlots. Mother and okay, abominations stop right of the earth. Stop right huh? there. Stop right there. Mystery Babylon is on this woman's head. All right. Mystery Babylon. As we just brought out, where did a lot of this stuff come from? It came from Babylon. All the other empires, empires had remnants of the initial Hermetic Empire, which started with Nimrod. So you see, Rome. A lot of that stuff that they do, you see it started and originated with um, Nimrod. And you see it in the Egyptian culture. You see the, the Ankh and all these different, the cross of Tammuz. You see that. You see all, You see the, the cross of the Roman Catholic Church. You see all this stuff. Uh, uh, the Babylon of Nimrod was into sun worship. What is the Sunday that was declared on 321, a papacy, an edict by Rome? You see how, you see this, y'all? It's right here in the Bible. But he says, the mother of harlots. The mother. Catholicism is the mother. Every religion, every religion that comes out is man-made and it's being sanctioned by who? It's being sanctioned by Rome. I don't care what you in. I don't care if you in Shinoism. I don't care if you in Hinduism. They talk about a one-world religion. Yes, it's a one-world religion. Because Rome controls it all. Don't you understand that Rome, that Rome is a country? You all know that Rome is a country? The smallest country in the world is the Vatican. They have their own country. They have their own country. Now, they're not the military power as they once was, but they don't need to be. Who fights for Rome? Who fights for them right now? United States. The United States. The United States does their bidding for them. So Rome is the power, their own country, the power. We talk about people talking about that the devil is messing with me, the devil in my house. The devil's not in your house. He's in Rome. He's at the Vatican. He can't be in more than one place at once. You crazy? The devil's doing that. Devil ain't doing nothing. He's in the seat of Rome right now, in the Vatican, where the power and the authority is at. Now, we talk about the, the, the feet of iron and of clay. Who is the clay? We know Rome is the iron, but it says that the clay and the iron should mingle in the feet and the toes. Who's the clay? Might be here in America. Okay, that's a thought. All right. Israel. Israel. Okay, that's a thought. Who is the clay? They said Great the Bible about who? Great Britain. That's a good thought, too. I, 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 yeah, that's good, Nehemiah. But if, when you look at the, 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 uh, the clay and the iron, who is the money pockets in the world? If Rome is the power, who's the money? London. That would be the, who? What, what group of people? Uh, the, uh, the Britain. The, the, uh, the who British. runs the banking system? China? Uh, okay. The Europeans. Okay. Ashkenazi Jews. Mm -hmm. Yes. Europeans. Yes. <laughs> The clay is them asking us when you look at the Supreme Court, you got That's six, Germany. you got six Roman Catholics. 
The other three are who? They're what? They're who? They're Jews. So, so now you see the power. Who put us in slavery as the Israelites? It was Rome that put the decree out for the Spains, the Spaniards, and the Portuguese to get us. Who gave the power, the money of that? Was the Jews. It's them. They are the ones that run the world. The Romans and the Jewish people. They're running this world right now. The Europeans, if you want to put them in the hole, it's their time. They're running. But the problem is right now, Mr. McCaw, time is bought up. The Negroes is waking. They call us niggers. The niggers is waking. They're awakening right now. That's the problem. The awakening is here. So once they understand the way, they know that their time is short. Now you see the world going haywire right now. You see all this stuff going on and all this and that. We're going to get the one world order and all this, all this stuff going on. Yes, because the awakening, this is biblical prophecy. The Hamites had their time and they did it well. Now the Europeans, Japheth's children, y'all had y'all's time. Y'all ran well. Y'all did a good job. And they, no, we're powerful than you Negroes. No, no, no. You had your time. This is prophecy. This even goes back to Genesis chapter 9, verse 27. Huh? Listen, out of the three sons of Noah, you have Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham had his time. Japheth's time is now. When is Shem's time? In the kingdom. Kingdom. In the kingdom. And here we go, y'all. We're moving to the kingdom. This is why the awakening is powerful. Hallelujah. This is why you awake, Nate. This is why you awake, Brandon. This is why you awake. Because we're the ambassadors of the coming kingdom. So now we're preparing the Israelites. We're preparing the people. We're preparing them for the kingdom of Shem, of the Shemites. Which is our time to shine. It's our time, y'all. Let's get ready to come. We're walking into that right now. Don't y'all see? The time of the Gentiles. Luke 21, 24, it's about to be fulfilled. Those people over in that land are not the bloodline of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're European descent, according to Genesis chapter 10. Javan, or Greeks, Ashkenazi, Germany, these people, the Medes, Russia, all these people are European descents. They run the world. This is why they got mad when they had Trump. Trump was their God. Trump was their God. And they got mad when Trump didn't get in office. These evangelicals, these evangelicals, and let me talk about this for a minute. Now, let, let, me, let me slow down. Let me go back. So we're talking about mother harlots, right? Talking about that. Catholicism in every religion is the daughter or the byproduct of Rome. All right, let's talk about the Reformation period. The Reformation period. Rome was in charge. Rome was, was, was over everything. Reformation means they want to reform and fix things. You had, at during that time, you had Catholic priests like Jan Hus, Martin Luther, John Wesley, uh, different reformers during that time. They were, part, they were Catholic priests. But understand, uh, during the terms of Catholic order, only the priests were able to read. The laity, laity are common people, are the common people. They were not allowed to read the scriptures. Only the priests were allowed to read. And then the people that the priests allowed to read, which was other priests, when these reformers start reading the scriptures, they challenge the doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church. Like what you're teaching us and what we're reading is not lining up. And so they want to reform it. So they, they call themselves like, OK, we don't really want to break away from y'all. We just want to reform it. But that, they want, But the Catholic Church wasn't having that. They wouldn't have that. So what happened was around 1200 AD, you had a reformation period where you had all these people re trying to reform. You had all these different doctrines. You had the Protestants. That word Protestants comes from the root word, root word of protest. Protest. That's where you get Protestants. All right. So they were called protesting Catholics. They came out of the Catholics, but they were protesting the system. They wanted to reform it. All right. They never really want to leave. They just want to reform it. But they came protest Protestants. So they took 
you know, what they believe this should be doctrine, but they took a lot of the Catholics' ways into the Protestant movement. So the Protestant movement, you get all these other denominations, 45,000 denominations that stem out of the Protestant movement, all right? You have that. So Pentecostals, uh, all these different uh, denominations come out of the Protestant movement, but they're still Catholic. They're still being deceived because they're still doing what Catholics do. Satan is still deceiving you. Because even though the process broke away, they still kept communion, Sunday worship, the cross, all these different things. They still kept them because they never wanted to leave the system. But the Catholic Church said, you know what? This is what we're going to do. We got a problem because we got reformers. So they had something called the Council of Laodicea or the, the Vatican I. And so they had a meeting and the Catholic got their people who they trusted. And what was set up was called the Jesus Society. How many know what Jesus Society is? Anybody knows the Jesus Society? I know, sir. All right. Here, this is what the Jesus Society is. It's our modern day Jesuit Illuminati. This is where you get that from. What the Catholic Church said, listen, let them go out and reform. But what we're going to do, we're going to raise up our secret society people that's going to infiltrate, infiltrate the movement of the Protestants. So therefore, y'all go and intermingle yourself in there as agents and spies, but you influence them with still the Roman Catholic culture. You still influence them. So when you see churches right now, that denominations, the Jesus Society is in them. That's why you see cats like Creflo. That's why you see cats like Jake's in them, because they have been infiltrated by the system. The Jesus Society, which now we understand as Illuminati, the Jesuits, Illuminati. This is where the Masons, that's why you see a lot of pastors are Masons. That's why you see a lot of um, uh, uh, Eastern stars in the church. Because they are there to blend themselves within. They're agents of the Catholic Church, of hey, the Maury. Catholic order. More. Yes. Ain't this new, uh, ain't the Pope, ain't he, the, ain't he a Jesuit? The, the, the Jesuit preached this the system. Back in the day, they had the Knight Templars. That was the power of the Catholic Church. In the modern day, the Jesuits are people that were raised them up from the Catholic priests that they trusted to send out to go inside of the other denominations. They were agents. They are agents. They are agents. And they want to, yeah, y'all gonna do y'all's thing if y'all want to. But I have people in the midst of y'all. I have people there that's keeping our system of the Catholic Church in these in these churches. This is why you have these denominations, and you have these masons there, and you have the, you have people there that's blending in secret society that's blending in these churches. That's why you look at why careful teaching like that. Why is Jake saying they don't see the Bible because they have been infiltrated by the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church runs every religion, Islam, everybody. Everybody's underneath the order of the Catholic Church. They're yeah, running well, everything. It is a one world religion going on right now because they control everything and they have so infiltrated Francis, everything. Yes. So Pope Francis is from the sect of the Jesuit priests. So he actually comes from that sect. So the Catholic Church has different sects, like a little, uh, little sister of the poor, the Jesuits, uh, the, the Dominicans. Um, so the prior pope was actually from the Dominican sect. Mm -hmm. The Jesuit sect is where Pope Francis is from, and the pope and the Jesuit sect got kicked out of France years mm -hmm. ago during the time of the Crusades or the Knights Templars. Mm -hmm. So when the Knights Templars was uh, crucified or killed by uh, their uh, worshiping of the Baphomet, as they was accused of, which they did, um, it was actually they were part of the Jesuit uh, sect. Yes, um, and that's and it was they was actually killed or burned at the stake on Friday the thirteenth. Mm. So that's where they came from. Bring it out. It was known to create chaos everywhere they go. That's what they're actually uh, designated for. Yes, sir. Good information. I, thank you for bringing that out. Now, now you see, excuse me, you see how the Catholic Church is running the world. You see how Revelation twelve and nine Satan deceived the whole world because he got everything, and it's all about you 
who they call darkies. It's all about you. It's all about you. The whole script of the movie is about you, about Israelites. It's about y'all. It's about us. And I'm, 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 this is my last slide. I'm done. But I want you to see something. Did anyone see the gift that was given from Mexico? That was given to um, they to America. It had the beach yeah, the, the leopard with the wings. Oh, yeah, y'all see that? United Nations. Yeah, yeah. See that? Okay, let's read that. Let's read this real quick, and we're going to be done. But this is this is what that present from Mexico was given to the United Nations. Let's read it. Revelation thirteen. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And upon the horns, ten crowns, upon his heads, the name of blaspheme. Verse two. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. Now, this is this is John now. John and Daniel or Revelations and Daniels. Daniel are bookends. They're bookends. They're like brothers and sisters. All right. And his feet were as the feet of the bear. Y'all see where we see the leopard at? Did we see that? Daniel 7? Who's the leopard? Who's the leopard, y'all? We just read it. Greece. 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 All right, Zakane. And Greece. the feet of the yes. And the feet of the bear. Who's the bear? Me's Persians. Yes. Actually, yes. Dale said Dale saw a vision. John seen the same thing. And his mouth. As the mouth of a lion, all right. Who was the lion? Babylon, all right. And the dragon, who's the dragon? We studied this weeks ago. Who was the dragon? Tanim, Satan. Who's the dragon? Who's it speaking of? Satan, Hasatan. yes, Hasatan gave him his power and his seat. And great authority. So this beast, this kingdom of the leopard, bear, lion, Satan gave this this beast its power. And what is this? This is what you're seeing. You're seeing a combination of all the kingdoms, all the empires into one. That's what he that this is what's being seen by John. He's seeing all the empires that was spoken of in Daniel. He's seen them one. It's a conglomerate of all of them together. All of them together. And Satan gave the power to this, to this system, and his seat and great authority. Yes, Satan did. Satan's behind this. He running it. This is his people. Verse 11, and I beheld another beast come out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. Mm. And he spake like a dragon. Who was that? Two horns like, the lamb, we know the lamb, the, this John said, behold the lamb of Yah that come to take away the sins of the world. So who is this two horns? So if it's not the, the true lamb, it's a fake lamb. The uh -oh. Who? It's the Antichrist. It's a goat. <laughs> well, that's a good one. I, I would say this two horns. It said it, it had two horns. The Pope. I, I, I feel you on that too, now, Nehemiah. It had two horns like a lamb, and he spake like a dragon. Mm. So it means that this thing comes across as being something peaceful. That's, you know, a lamb is peaceful, but it had two horns like a lamb, and it spake as a dragon, which means it's deceiving somebody. This system here. All right, let's read verse 12. And he exercised all the power of the first beast. You know, the first beast was the system of all the empires. And causes the earth of them which dwell therein to worship the first beast. All right, so this beast right here, it's causing the world to worship that first beast, which is the system of Rome, all the empires together. So this beast right here that came up is causing it to worship. Who? Whose daddy one was healed. <laughs> Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh. 